All right. Thank you very much for coming, ladies and gentlemen. We appreciate your attendance, and we, uh, I, I'd like to begin by welcoming the people in the room as well as the people who are out there uh, watching via the media site uh, system that uh, is in effect. You out there will also be able to ask questions. There is a question button in the upper left-hand corner of your screen over here, and uh, you can use that to send questions. We won't be answering them back through the media site system. We'll just t turn the questions over to Bill Sams, our speaker, and he will respond, and you'll be able to hear it that way. So for those of you who aren't in the room, that's how it'll happen. For those of you who are in the room, after Bill's session, we have two microphones. You can come up to either microphone, and we'll just bounce back and forth between the two for questions. With that said, I'd like to welcome our uh, gracious speaker, Bill Sams. Bill is the uh, creator of... Oops, I think I just may have turned my microphone. No, it's still working. Bill is the creator of the video, Epic 2020. I don't remember how I saw it on the, uh, on the interwebs, but somebody, I think, sent it to me. I watched it, and it uh, really helped stimulate my thinking and my, my sense of urgency, which was exactly his uh, plan for that video. If you haven't seen it yet, please take a look. You'll be doing yourself a favor. It's a 10-minute version. It's at epic2020.org. Along with other documents, he's using that sort of as a place to uh, store documents of interest to people like us who are trying to change uh, higher education to uh, move with the times and remain relevant. So by way of introduction, I'll, I'll keep it short, but I'll just say that uh, Bill Sams has completed a two-year assignment as the Associate Provost for Information Technology and Chief Information Officer at Ohio University. <clears throat> He's now an executive in residence at the College of Business at Ohio University. And previously, he was the program director for a $5 million U.S. Department of Labor wired grant for workforce development in Ohio. He's facilitated training programs for Ohio, Ohio University, uh, Without Boundaries program, and uh, taught senior and graduate level e-business management classes for Ohio University as well. He has uh, received his BBA and MBA from Ohio University and a JD, uh, that's a, a, a law degree, from the U University of Santa Clara. His career includes four years in the Air Force, where he received the Bronze Star, and 25 years in management positions in Silicon Valley. Have you heard of Silicon Valley before? <laughs> right. Well, he was there at, at you know, ground zero during the whole Silicon Valley takeoff. And uh, he was involved in, since the early 70s at Fairchild Semiconductor, and he's been involved in several startup operations, one turnaround operation, his positions included Vice President of Marketing and Sales, Vice President of Operations, General Manager of Key Division of a Fortune 500 company, LSI Logic. And he's also a member of the E-Tech Ohio Commission. Well, we took a delegation of uh, about 12 people out to the E-Tech Ohio Conference. Well, he's in charge of the E-Tech Ohio group that puts on that conference, but more importantly, they're in charge of the internet connections for K-12 schools and the IT infrastructure in all the K-12 schools in Ohio as well. Uh, there's more I could say, but I think I'll just say very interesting man, corporate IT background, uh, retired early at the age 48, set off with his wife to do a 10-year tour on their 46-foot sailboat, uh, which ended after two great years and one bad day. Uh, and a reef. It had something to do with a reef. Don't think it, it wasn't marital. It was a reef that kind of got in the way. So with that, I'll turn it over. And I want to thank Bill for coming. I, he didn't know me when I reached out to him, and he did a Skype session and really uh, created great conversations, agreed to come here again. And I really appreciate you uh, stepping out of retirement yes again, yet again. You're sort of the Michael Jordan of uh, this stuff. But anyway, thank you for coming. Okay. I, oh, you I, I've right? got it. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Peck, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for being here. It's, it's quite an honor to be at Penn State. And uh, I've certainly, yesterday we had a fantastic day and enjoyed all the conversations. And I'm very impressed with both the faculty and students here. You're, you're doing some great things. What I want to do today, and I'm actually uh, pleased that I have the opportunity to introduce the concept of holistic enhancement at Penn State. So this will be the marker of where, at least from my perspective, I laid out 
this idea and it goes forward from here. I can't think of a more appropriate place or a group of people to do this with. So if you bear with me through just a few of these uh, slides, uh, I'll explain to you what holistic enhancement is and why it's important. Now, one of the great American philosophers, Yogi Berra, um, made the famous quote, the, the future ain't what it used to be. And that is certainly true in higher education and education in total today. Two weeks ago, there was an article that said uh, by Clayton Christensen, he's the father or the coiner of disruptive innovation and all that kind of stuff, a Harvard business professor, <clears throat> that in the next 15 years, he projects that half of the universities in the United States may be in bankruptcy. The California legislature just last week, just one week ago, is starting to draft legislation that will uh, provide the requirement that state-supported schools provide transferable credit to students that can pass a proctored exam but delivered online by places like Udacity and Coursera. In Ohio, uh, we are working with Udacity right now to develop online courses or for uh, both advanced placement and uh, math remediation. As you may know, 30-some percent, at least in Ohio, come to the universities and cannot pass the math qualification tests. And this is a very, very big uh, problem. <clears throat> Coursera. <clears throat> in seven months, Coursera has reached one million uh, students enrolled. <clears throat> it took Facebook 10 months to enroll one million people. So Coursera is on a faster growth rate than was Facebook. And I would remind you that edX has set a goal of educating one billion students. Facebook is now five years old and just passed the one billion mark. So that target from edX is not as unreasonable as you uh, might first think. <clears throat> this is something that you should be familiar with, and I'm sure Penn State is a uh, subscriber to the Gartner Research, and if you find whoever your person is, they can get you this entire uh, presentation of what all these different things mean. And I would suggest that if you're in academic technology, you should have a working knowledge of all of these. The MOOC that is right up there um, wasn't on the 2011 chart. Didn't exist back then. So this is where it's gone up. It's colored to be in two to five years. It will be mature. Very fast rate of introduction. But my point here is that it's just not about MOOCs. It's about this entire chart of what's happening and the synergies that are coming. Big data, Udacity is collecting massive amounts of information on the students, and they are going to know more about how they learn and think and what they can do, how they help others, uh, leadership, teamwork. They will be able to give a resume to corporations that is unequaled in, in current times today. Um, other areas, adaptive learning. This is five to ten years out. Adaptive learning is where your online learning will sense through artificial intelligence how you learn best on that kind of subject and will adapt the presentation to you to give you that. So if you're learning chemistry, it may be in one way. If you're learning history, it may be in another way. But once adaptive learning happens in these things, it's going to be very, very difficult to argue that the traditional system is superior. Uh, others, e-textbooks, of course, e-portfolios are going to be very uh, important, and game consoles as media hubs is going to be allowing uh, the courses to come right into people's homes. I spend some time every year down in Mexico, and in Mexico, there are more television sets than refrigerators. So, and most of those television sets have game consoles connected to them. So 
that's going to change a lot of things there, hopefully. And they haven't even included on the chart augmented reality. And once you add that in, and then other technologies that are coming out like Google Glass, I don't know if you've seen that, where it's a little thing out here, and it gives you the impression of a five-foot wide screen, and whatever you're looking at, it can give you additional data on what you are seeing. In my mind, that technology will obsolete the computer hardware industry. So it's going to be a whole new thing. Your monitor will really be right there. Okay, so those are the technologies that are coming. And that's why when Yogi said the future ain't what it used to be in higher education and all education, that really, really applies. In my mind, <clears throat> this is the most exciting time there has ever been to be in education. We are on the verge of the golden era of education where edu world-class education is going to be available to everyone in the world for free. And it is hard to even imagine the cultural and economic consequences of that kind of thing. And with what you're doing here, the MOOCs you're developing, you're going to be part of that whole change. So <clears throat> in any strategic management, they, uh, there's one theory that most companies figure out uh, what they do by how they do it, but they never answer the question of why they do something. And I want to answer that right from the front. Why, what is the why of holistic enhancement? And I would suggest it's nothing short of the optimization of the potential of every person. And if you think about that, if any organization or group or society that you're in uses that as a touchstone for the decision processes they make, that we will make every decision based on optimizing the potential of every person in the group. It's hard to get a better standard. And this is one that I've used in, in, in my life as how I, I judge things. Because if we're moving into a knowledge economy and a knowledge age, then it's the human capital of what people can do that is the value. It's more value than anything else. And so this is the why of holistic enhancement. Now, here is an overview of uh, the background in that we have a changing nature, nature not only of our jobs but of our lives. And these are experiential, skill-based, and in many cases virtual. There's now 1.2 billion people that are in or that have avatars in virtual worlds. Now, 95% of them are under 25. <clears throat> and it's this wave of young people that have grown up in virtual worlds that is coming at us. And, and they're going to think differently, act differently. Uh, we've got MOOCs, and um, I'm assuming everybody knows what a MOOC is, but the, the key thing here is that for the first time in the history of education, industrial process development systems are being used. Total management, total quality management systems are being introduced. When you're teaching 100,000 people at one time, the learning rate versus teaching 30 is orders of magnitude greater if you pay attention. And groups like Udacity are paying attention. They're measuring each element of what they're teaching and how long does it take people to get that, how can we communicate it better, how can we make it clearer. And as they teach the next 100,000, which is only a few months away, not the three to five year typical course cycle adjustment, they'll get better again. So this is industrial production. Big data, as I've already said, the analytics that come out of it, the information that's gained of not only how fast do you learn, how well do you retain it, how many people have you helped learn it, that's all going to be there. It's already a commodity. I mean, that happened right out the door. It's free. It's free to the user. 
And it's free because there's different value propositions that are being used. And this is the same example that of Google and the newspaper industry, is that Google had a different value proposition than the newspaper industry where they were selling classified ads. And so there wasn't any competition there. I mean, it, it's a whole different way of doing it. And MOOCs have a different value proposition as well. <clears throat> and new value models. Uh, Udacity as is using an employment agency model. They have 350 companies that have signed up to get the resumes of 3,000 students. And any of those students that get hired, those companies will pay to Udacity a headhunter fee. That averages 20 to 30 percent of the employee's first year salary. And at the level that they're uh, hiring at these kind of talent, this kind of talent, 50 students represent a million dollars. So they've got 3,000 resumes out. So that's the new value proposition in that the value of the top 5% of representing them in an employment agency funds the development and presentation of the course to the rest of the world for free. Corporate sponsorship. Udacity has six companies, Google, Microsoft, four other high-tech companies that are paying them to develop courses that teach skills that these companies desperately need. Now, in an online MOOC, 95% plus of your cost is in course development and presentation. I mean, once you get it developed, distributing it, is it it's an internet server thing. I mean, the cost is almost not measurable. So that's another area. Certificate fees, edX is using that. And you take the course free, you do the homework and exams graded free. At the end of the course, you decide you've passed it, you've shown mastery of the subject, and now you want a certificate. Well, you can write into them and it will probably be less than $100 to get a certificate that you completed and mastered this course. Now you say, well, $100 is not much. But until you put six zeros on the back of it, and that's a hundred million. And when they're teaching well over a hundred thousand in each course, that's not an unreasonable kind of thing either. Advertising, they haven't even got to that yet, but it'll be coming. And the same with subscription services. I'm currently enrolled in a statistics class at Udacity, not because I wanted to take a 10 week course, but because periodically I want to know the part about statistics. I am in that course for the rest of my life. So whether I do it in 10 weeks or 10 years, I don't know how much beyond that I'll have, but uh, the point is they've got me as a customer for the rest of my life for anything I want to know about statistics. Now apply that to accounting and other professions and think if your accounting department had every student that they've taught for the last 20 years still subscribing to the courses that they took. Do you think they'd pay a subscription fee? Sure. And are there four companies that would probably sponsor the development, like Pricewaterhouse and Coopers and Library? Sure. So those kinds of things are going to happen as well. Now, this is a new term I just actually coined this afternoon. Um, and I've got to remember what it is. <laughs> these oh how would you say that oh oaks oaks okay these are online course skill aggregators now where the MOOCs Udacity and Coursera and everybody goes out there and they say we've got we're us and we do this and we've got all these courses these go out and say what do you want to learn I want to learn how to program in Python 253 online offerings in Python rated by cost or rated by time to take it. And eventually they'll have a five-star Amazon rating system that you'll have review by students. So this is a whole new level to look at things. Skilled Up does all courses and open education database 
is mainly uh, ones that you can actually get degrees and uh, things from. Badges. Uh, Mozilla, just a year ago, a little over a year ago, came out with the idea of badges. Uh, whoops. Um, excuse me. I personally don't like the term badge because I think it, it doesn't really fit. I started to argue for soap bubbles because, uh, you know, you can picture those uh, all clustering together and inside of each other and stuff like that. And I, I kind of see that, how knowledge works better. But I haven't convinced anybody yet that soap bubbles are better than badges. And, uh, but I think the people that really have broken the code on how to measure skills is the online gaming people like World of Warcraft and EverQuest. Because I can tell you I'm a necromancer 68, and anybody that's in EverQuest knows exactly what I do, what I can do, and how I fit in an organization or group that's doing something. So I encourage you to, to look at the game industry, not necessarily to develop a game, but they have figured out how to engage people and how to motivate them and excite them. And I would suggest that wouldn't hurt a lot of the efforts. Skills versus degrees. A degree is a static point in time kind of thing that what does it tell you five years later? And I've, I've got a blog post coming out this week that basically says there's a depreciation value to degrees. And in fact, a lot of people will say the half-life of a computer science degree is less than five years. Now, if you're paying off a 10-year loan, you're probably wondering why you did that. But um, we, we need to think about that because it, as badges and, and skills, um, as things that define skills in smaller increments, what you're going to find is industry is going to be very interested in the mapping the skills they need for specific jobs. And so will trade associations. So you're going to see a lot of uh, things happening in the next uh, couple of years on that. And personal portfolios of what have you actually done? Not the, the fact that you got a C in something. How did you get the C? What kind of report did you write or those kinds of things? And these will be lifelong. You'll be able to give different people access to different parts of it and uh, searchable. Uh, there'll be databases that can look at what you can do and what employers are needing, and they'll say, oh, here's a match made in heaven kind of thing. Okay, this is holistic enhancement from my point of view. It is core skills that you need. It is content knowledge, and I would argue to you that this is where traditional higher education is right now. It is primarily a supplier of content knowledge. And in 10 years, this is the last place you want to be because that's going to be a commodity that's going to be free with uh, systems that go to your learning style and all those other things. Emotional intelligence is going to be very important. Concept of Network Weaver, that's a title I put below me. It's a person that enjoys connecting people and ideas is a Network Weaver, and there's a great website on this. Uh, technology augmentation, and I'll talk about all of these uh, in more detail. So what are the core skills? I'd say they're not what we've traditionally thought about, reading, writing, and arithmetic, but they are language, spoken, and programming. The ability to program a computer is going to be very important. I uh, have put up native 4 and 1 and 2, but as the Google Translate technologies get stronger and stronger, I'm not sure how much longer it will I'm still waiting for the plug-in. Uh, now that I've got hearing aids, I've got something to plug it into um, that will help me with foreign language. But information assimilation. The, the people of tomorrow are going to be, we talk about drinking out of a fire hose now with all the information coming out. They're going to be standing under Niagara Falls. I mean, the amount of information that's going to come out is that reading at the normal reading speed is just not good enough. And um, I surprised a, a class I was teaching. They asked me how in 30 minutes I read all the things that, that I required 30 of them to submit little reports. I'd read the reports, know where they were coming from on a subject, and then I could 
pit one against another because I knew they had different ideas about it. And it's a lot of fun. But I just blurted out, I read concepts. And I realized that's what I really do. I don't read words anymore. I read concepts. So that's the kind of thing that people are going to have to do. Speed listening. Uh, I could talk three times as fast as I am right now, and you would understand it, and your mind would not wonder because I'm not talking fast enough to totally engage everything that you can think about. So that's where everybody wanders off. Data scanning, the ability to look at huge amounts of information. And I would suggest that it's going to change from numbers to colors and sounds and movement so that when you look at something, you will see a movement and color and change that has meaning to you, but it will represent orders of magnitude more data than you can ever possibly see in just numbers. And analytics, of course, goes with making sense out of all that. Communication, personal, verbal, of course, but digital. Texting, emails, audio, video, virtual worlds, telepresence. Uh, the first telepresent robot has been approved for hospitals that can roll around and it's got a little iPad on it that the doctor's face shows up on and it uh, can interact with the machinery that's taking vital signs of the patient so a doctor could have uh, uh, calls in Boston in one hour in New York in the next hour in LA in the next hour all in, in telepresence and I, I can't wait to have some of the meetings I spend three hours driving to to have my little bot roll in and, and do something there. Okay, so that's the core skills. Now, in the area of content knowledge, and again, this is where um, I think traditional education is, I'm breaking it down into two segments, and then, again, it's based on my experience in industry, and in that when I started out, we had the just-in-case inventory concept. And, you know, we have a lot of things just in case we need them. Well, we teach a lot of things just in case somebody needs them. And we don't have that luxury anymore. There's too many things that somebody's got to know to waste it on just in case. So we've got to really ask tough questions about what's in just in case. Certainly, a, a platform knowledge of math and chemistry and all of and this is not intended to be an exhaustive list, but just to give you an example, so that you at least have the conceptual fundamentals of what happens. And just like an industry, now the really successful companies, just like the really successful people in the future, will be just in time. And Ray Kurzweil, uh, the singularity is near, is now at Google as the head of their artificial intelligence program working on search engines that will give you information as you need it. And you will feel like you always knew it. So that is just in time information. And, and I wouldn't bet against Ray. He's done some pretty phenomenal things in his lifetime. Okay, now emotional intelligence. Of course, this is the standard self-awareness and all that kind of stuff. And I would suggest that certainly in the residential environment, there is huge opportunities to hit this area that are everybody, oh, I had a great college experience and stuff, but it wasn't something that was consciously done by the institution. It was a random event that either fortuitously happened or didn't happen. And if it's so important, and I argue it is, then it should not be a random event. We should spend a lot more time thinking about how emotional intelligence can be developed in people. Okay, Network Weaver. Basically, uh, this is really a social network awareness kind of thing of what is the interrelation. I have built a whole bunch of new nets in the last two days of people that I didn't know on Monday that I know now that will probably be communicating for long periods of time. They're connected to other people. And how do all of these things work? It goes back really to that, you know, the six degrees of separation kind of thing. But again, this is an area that we typically do not manage. 
and we do not consciously think about it. And I would encourage you to uh, uh, go to the networkweaver.com website. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, coined the term, speaks internationally on it, and it, it's really a, an eye-opening kind of thing of, of mapping out where are the thought leaders and, and how do those work. And also you find people that are in positions that should have people telling them things are not. And those are problems as well. And so that's knitting the net. Uh, augmentation. Of course, hardware is under Moore's law. And it's going to continue for at least the next decade. It's pretty clear that the technologies are available to continue every two years doubling the capability of, of the uh, thing and lowering the cost by half. And I spent 25 years of my life under that law making products that did that. That's why you can appreciate the uh, whiplash I had when I came into the academic world. <laughs> and, uh, they don't have the same change in productivity <laughs> taking place here. But software, of course, there's over 800 or 800,000 apps now, I think, for the iPad. Uh, there's so much stuff being developed out there. But wetware, and that's what you develop here, it's wetware. The stuff up here. And how do we make that better? How do we think more effectively? What can we do to just be more efficient in, in how we think? And there, there are areas that study this. And, and this, again, is something that the, the residential campus is, is very well situated to do. And digital wisdom, this is a term that's just coming out. And it's basically saying, there is so much stuff here. I have got to make a wise decision of what I use and what I don't, how I integrate it. And we've all done this. We've, we've gone off on one platform or something, and two years later, there's something else, and there's no from here to there kind of thing, and you got all the pain of, of going back and forth. Well, that's kind of where digital wisdom is. And then personal development of who we are, what we do, our health, physical and mental, and our family. These are all part of the holistic enhancement. And I would suggest they are all a potential part of what's done at a residential university. And it's not just done while somebody's here. It's done for the rest of their life. Because this is a unique place with the expertise to know how to do these things but it's not getting communicated. It's not being sold to them. It's not being, excuse me, productized to them. So uh, one of the things I, I wanted to make some recommendations on uh, what a residential university could do, and I have a um, management concept. I call it the judo concept. And when you're facing a competitor that has overwhelming advantages, and I would suggest MOOCs for the delivery of content have overwhelming advantages that you want to take the force they have and through some adroit movements, channel it to where you need it. So use them rather than fight them. Value models, residential experiences. You've certainly got the traditional one. But you've got adult renewal. Higher education is the only industry I've ever seen that has a great customer for four years, throws them out the door on the day, day they graduate, then has the nerve to come back in five to ten years and ask them to pay more money for the experience they had. And what amazes me is they do. So I, I've, I admire that. <laughs> but it's why let go of somebody once you've got them? And that's what Udacity's figured out. They will never let go of me on that, and I don't want them to. And how do you maintain that connection? Uh, and youth camps, of either virtually, uh, virtual worlds, or how can you connect with kids and even grade school uh, on doing things? Then the value models, employment agency, I've talked about corporate sponsors, government sponsors. If if we say tuition's going away, government has still got an interest in a lot of things being taught. 
And they should pay for it, but I think they will pay not in tuition, but in sponsorships of specific programs that then can be offered across the country uh, for free, uh, and they'll pay for it up front. Advertising. Um, I know, you know, we don't like to do it in the classroom, but I would suggest probably at a football stadium near here, there's a certain amount of advertising that goes on. If it works there, is it different students sitting in those seats than sitting in a classroom? Uh, so that's an, another place. And that could be companies sponsoring rooms and, and things like that. I mean, it doesn't have to be blatant things. But, and I see it like Pricewaterhouse and those corporations doing. Student ventures. If we're really good at creating critical thinking, innovative, entrepreneurial people, why don't we have our foundation invest in them and start up companies? All you have to do is go out to Stanford and drive down Sand Hill Road. And Sand Hill Road is littered with corporate headquarters of students that came out of Stanford. And by the way, Stanford's got stock in all of them. And Stanford's got one heck of an endowment. And a lot of it came from those startups. And you've got your innovation thing and all that kind of So you got the, the foundation's all here. It's just kind of like up the game one level. Corporate training. Um, I know I have an argument with the dean of the College of Business all the time and that he says, well, hey, Bill, we're, uh, you know, I talk to people in the industry and they're really happy with, you know, what we're doing and all this kind of stuff. And I accuse him of uh, drinking the alumni Kool-Aid. Because the people he talked to, talks to, are alumni. Well, of course they love the place. But when you get off to the, the company that's trying to hire computer science programmers and has to go to California to try to bring them back to Ann Arbor, that's something wrong with, with that kind of thing. So, uh, but there, higher education and industry need to come together. There, there is too much separation right now. Industry is desperate for what can be done here, but there's not enough of a conversation going on. And it, MOOC partnerships, and you're, you're, you're not only creating your own MOOCs, but you'll have, the, and you're involved in Coursera and all that kind of stuff, and so that's, that's right on. You're, you're certainly started well there. So the recommendations I would have if I ever got to talk to anybody that could do something about it, uh, would be that you have to have an independent, customer-centric, standalone organization. I saw this model work with IBM. I was selling semiconductor chips into the IBM mainframe group. I was selling semiconductor chips into Apple. I was sole, at, at the company that sold sourced with them for the first three years. IBM woke up and said, oh, these personal computers are really coming. And so they said, we need a personal computer. Well, their mainframe group's in New York, and they put their PC group in Florida, and nobody in New York was permitted to go to Florida. They kept them totally separate because they didn't want the PC group contaminated by the mainframe thinking. They wanted them to have the power to go whatever way they would and that's what they did. Mainframes kept getting smaller and smaller. PCs got bigger and bigger. So you have got to have an independent, customer-centric, standalone organization. Partnership with MOOCs, partners with the industry and government, and think of things in terms of a lifetime, holistic enhancement of customers. And I use the word customers, and I... I I, I use, the way I explain it is when you say students, there's an implied students is something, someone we do something to. Customers are someone we do something for. And when you start using the word customer, you start thinking about what you're doing in an entirely different way. And I, I think that's going to be important to the survival of the organizations that will remain. That's it. So uh, I'd like to turn it over for questions. And Dr. Peck. And okay, at this point, anybody with questions, come to the microphones. <coughs> oh. 
<laughs> you have to model that behavior. I just realized I was violating what I was about to say. <laughs> so you come to the microphones because the people who are watching outside of this room won't be able to hear the question unless you do so. Anyone? <laughs> Well, if not, I'll, I'll ask the first question about that. So that you're, you're suggesting what I think I heard Michael Horn suggest at the Blue White Vision Council, that Penn State create a separate entity that can offer a new form of higher education to constituents that is not bound by the same rules for course approvals and all the things that we currently operate under. You, you see that as uh, sort of a necessary next step in the evolution of universities in general. Uh, I, I think I'm hearing you say that a university that's going to make it through this is going to have to do something very radical like create a separate skunk works operation that creates a, the, the PC equivalent of the mainframe uh, IBM company. Is that, you want, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And that, um as I had referenced Clayton Christensen, who's the kind of the, the father of uh, disruptive technology and things like that, he's at Harvard. And Harvard and MIT have partnered to form edX. Now, they didn't make it a skunk works. They put $30 million from each of them in there, $60 million to get this puppy going. And the head of it doesn't have to go to any faculty committee. He can make the decision. This is the exact model that IBM used in putting their PC group in Florida and keeping the mainframe group up in New York. So, the, yeah, that's exactly. But uh, And I'm even arguing it's, in, it's okay if uh, Skunk Works is the only way, but $60 million is probably going to make a successful organization. Well, I didn't mean to imply by Skunk Works <laughs> that it should be uh, underfunded. Yeah, or it right, should be, right, right, right. Uh, it's just basically it's... Uh, so Apple did the same thing when they created the Macintosh. Mm -hmm. They created, took a series of people, took them off the main location, right. gave them complete freedom and said, you know, build the next generation. Right. In that case, it was computer. In our case, it's next generation higher ed institution. Right. Other and, questions? And, and let me just uh, add a, a little bit more on that. It, and where you can really see it is if you take two whiteboards and on one write down everything we know about the best ways of teaching. And then on the other, write down how we do it. And then see if you can draw any lines between them. Because I would argue there are very few correlations. But that's, I've actually done that in a class, <laughs> and you're, you're right. I said, you know, write down everything you believe, everything you know about how people learn, everything you believe to be true about how people learn, everything you suspect, and even with three different categories, <laughs> You know, it doesn't say, you know, everybody should move at the same pace. It doesn't say, right. you know, they should come here and sit and listen when, and you go home and struggle with things right. and so on. So right. that's a good point. If there are no other questions, I'll keep going. Okay, Larry, jump up. Bill, this is um, uh, very, very interesting. It sort of blows my mind in terms <laughs> of the, the system. So I'm, I'm curious. Um, I like the judo metaphor and, and the idea. Um, some of us in higher, uh, higher education are probably not as swift as we may need to be. The institutions are, the way they're built are not particularly, we, sometimes we are more like a uh, cruise ship than we are like a canoe. Um, what do we, what aspects of the system of higher education do we need to consider in terms of being able to be more adaptive and responsive to some of these changes? I'm thinking about cultural issues with governance and, and the way we think about, you mentioned before, we're really about content creation and management, that that's our current metaphor. What are the kinds of things that we should be considering as an institution in order to become more responsive to these changes? Boy, I wish I could give you an answer to that question in that, well, let me give you an example of my experience at Ohio University. The provost was trying to make a decision. We were on quarters. Of course, 90% of the U.S. is on semesters. And so a faculty committee was put together to decide to sort out which is better, quarters or semesters. The committee took one year and reported back that they could not make a decision. 
Now, that just isn't going to work in the Internet age. And I don't know how you change a culture that is so deep and with so many cross-checks. The word that rarely gets used in higher education is uh, leadership, in that you have administrators who haven't helped them if they ever try to lead because they get <laughs> slapped around real quick. They've got shared governance. And I have yet to see a committee design a revolutionary product. It's the Steve Jobs. It's the people with vision that set those standards out and then the rest say, yeah, here we go. And that's, Udacity's got it in Sebastian Fern. He's a visionary. And he's leading. And so I, in a lot of ways, higher education looks like the integrated steel industry in 1950. And Christensen writes eloquently of how they made very rational decisions within the paradigm of the world that they believed. But the world had changed. But they didn't believe that. And, and many in higher ed have uh, one of the most serious cases of denial and cognitive dissonance. But it happens in every industry. I mean, this is not unique. Blockbuster saw Netflix coming for five years. And what was Blockbuster's response? We'll be a better Blockbuster. Well, they had the wrong model. There was nothing they could do to be good enough to survive. And the other classic case is, is in the uh, print book distribution. You've got Barnes & Noble that are moving as fast as their little legs will carry them to get the nooks and e-books and all this, and you've got borders. Gone. So that's what I'm trying, and that's what I was trying to get across with Epic 2020. I wanted to be so provocative and shocking and make such outrageous claims, which interestingly are coming true, um, that people would be shocked out of, oh, this will always be the way. Because I've had many, many faculty tell me, oh, you know, we've had these problems before, and they, they go away. Well, this one's not going away. Hello, I'm an uninvited guest. Good. I actually, I, I actually work here at the library, and I see students coming through. I see faculty members coming through. I see what they're trying to do. I see what they're trying to avoid. In what you've described, I agree that there's a lot of entrenchment, and it would be nice to be able to move faster. But I know there's something called peer review. I'm sorry? There's something called peer review. Peer review, yes, yes, yes. It doesn't sound like yes. that's going to take place in your model. Right. It also sounds as if there's very little opportunity for innovation or for inspiration for an individual to be able to have that huge impact on another individual and spark that creative urge to really strive for something yeah. well beyond anything any of us might have thought of. Now, I'm not complaining about the idea that there are computer programs out there that can help you learn most effectively. Right. But what is it that they're teaching you? Is it something that is really going to help you, or is it something that someone else thinks is going to fit beautifully in that one of 350 corporations? Um, I knew a gentleman about... Mm, 40 years ago, who sounded a great deal like you. But he was talking on a completely different subject. There are individuals like yourself that, that sound off the clarion call that say, look, you've got to do something, you've got to change. And I'm not even going to say but. We've got to change. My concern is that are we changing in the right direction? Are we taking the individual out of what has made a university education so valuable. All those different concepts that you had, and I, I love your, your screens. I mean, I thought they were great. The focus being each individual process, 
as opposed to how does that person fit in the process? Where do you have the individuals that really guide you to the point where you can start using the technology and, and take off? So my apologies, I, I'll, oh, I'll get off my soapbox. No, no, no. I, I would love to hear I'm, I'm right your response. You. I'm <laughs> right with you, and I, I appreciate your perspective. And I, I think um, in holistic enhancement, I, I'm really pleading for the move toward that connection with people. And I would suggest in a chemistry class that has three or 400 people in it, there's not a whole lot of connection. And particularly when it's synchronous and you sit there for an hour, it's not effective. Uh, so I'm saying, again, in the judo thing, of where you can use these things to teach math and chemistry and those things, use them. Free up the people to do the human part, the very connections, the motivation, the stimulation that, that you're talking about. I think that's where it's got to shift to, uh, those kinds of things. In, in the Khan Academy, uh, experiments out in Palo Alto. Uh, teachers uh, in what's called the flipped classroom no longer teach content. They assign the videos. The kids go home or work on it at, at school, and when they come back in, the teacher knows exactly who has mastered the content and who's having problems. The teacher can focus on the people with the problems or team them up with other people. And so now the teacher becomes a facilitator and a coach and a mentor. And I know in my own personal life, uh, the ring I wear today was for a Mid-American Championship swimming team. And that coach was my second father. And he did more to change my life than any other professor I can think of. So it's that kind of personal connection, because on a, a team, you really get that <laughs> kind of thing. So I, I agree with your points, um, and I consciously overstate some of these things. That, uh, in Susan's talk, she's so methodical and so careful on what she says, I, it, and that's great. And fortunately, I, I don't, I can kind of be a rebel and a stirrer-upper and, and things like that, <laughs> so that's what I do. <laughs> I had a question that I think will somewhat bounce off that in terms of I definitely think there are significant areas in higher education that need to or will be forced to change. I don't know that that necessarily means higher education needs to follow a corporate model. Oh, yeah. But I think there are things kind of sprinkled throughout that suggest that. Uh, oh, okay. I got and I think that... I we could all point to many, 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 many things about the corporate model that need to change, whether it's ethical violations, significant layoffs, corruption, embezzlement, et cetera. So I think that there's sort of being a conflation between these are areas of problems with higher education that I think you'd have pretty significant agreement with in the room to the solution is to operate more like a traditional business. So, for example, you mentioned why not do advertising in the classrooms. Yeah. And I immediately heard about 40,000 professors saying why you wouldn't do that. Because part of what, at least currently, is a core value of so many classes is critical thinking even about the very business that you're part of. So why you wouldn't advertise in the classroom is that should be the same classroom you're taught to critically look at those advertisements. So I think that there, I think I agree with 65%, I would say. Uh -huh. But I, I just worry about the conflation between these are the things wrong with higher education without an equally critical view of these are the things wrong with industry that we're trying to partner with. So I wonder if you were to apply the same critical lens to the industry, what your points would be. Uh, and I, that's a very fair question. And I think uh, all too often industry is used as this huge catch-all. And there, there are huge differences between different industries. I'm consulting for a company right now that does agile software programming development. 
And they've got 30 job openings. They cannot find the talent they need, and so their business is limited by that. And so they're starting farm teams that are actually training uh, students in college uh, for free on weekends of how, how to do these kinds of things. But the, the challenge I'm working with them on is that they have these very capable technical people that want to be promoted. And so they come and say, well, you know, I've done this for two years, time for me to be promoted. Well, yeah, you're technically great, but you don't have the stuff. They say, okay, well, what's the stuff? Well, we realized we didn't know what the stuff was. It was like pornography. You know it when you see it, but, but it's leadership. It's emotional intelligence. It's all these kinds of things. And, and this is a company that I think you would be impressed with because their thing is, Tell us what you want to become, and we'll do our best to help you. And that may be here or someplace else, but we will honestly help you get there. And so I see this revolution happening in particularly technology companies. I, Google, you know, take one day out of the week and you do whatever you want kind of thing. Um, so that's where I come. I, now I also taught um, a graduate course at Ohio University for people that were in the machine metal bending industry. And I was shocked at the problems they were telling me about. I thought that world went away 40 years ago, but it's still there. And I, I would, you know, I said, how, how can you even think like that today? <laughs> so, yeah, I agree. I, I think there's a continuum just like in education. There's, you know, high value and then there's uh, courses that fail 50% of the students. So. Other questions? Yes, come on up. Um, technology seems to be allowing us to have something of a sort of a fast food metaphor for education. So, and we can see in different food models, there's quality that, nut that gives nutrition and feeds you and so on, and then there's another that's just a quick fix and meets our needs at that moment and doesn't sustain or prop, you know, give proper nutrients. And that's the thing that I'm wondering about with a MOOC model. Content is so pervasively important, the quality and the level. And then on top of it, the level at which you address the aesthetic experience using colors and how that, how visual culture is going to be impacted. Mm -hmm. um, with this kind of model, how does that, the repercussions affect the industry and diffuse through higher education. Because if you look at the fast food industry, um, how they centralize food distribution and everything, it's affected farming and everything. I hope I'm not going way too off on the metaphor, but the thing is, is how is that going to affect schools? Is it going to reduce the number of higher education universities because of MOOCs providing most of all the information? the talk and issues of the homogenization of education and information and how that affects cultures all over the world. Um, so I'm just kind of what your thoughts are on those type of ripple effects through it. Oh, yeah, wow. That, <laughs> there's so many ways I can go on that one. Um, let me try. Um, as far as will there be a reduction in the number of higher education institutions, yes. I think there's no question about that. Uh, as associate provost, I had access to the, you know, the financials of Ohio University, and I realized, again, with 25 years in industry and companies that were growing very fast or in very competitive markets, the margins in higher education are very thin. You have a 5 to 10 percent reduction in revenue, and you set off a series of uh, negative reinforcing events because they don't have the management expertise. Does anybody make a strategic decision, or do they say everybody takes a 6% cut? Well, you know what they do. So that's a death spiral. And it doesn't, they're not, many are not very far away from the cliff that they're going over. So yes, I think um, they're going to be less. Now, let me uh, digress a little bit on, uh, say, McDonald's. Uh, Last month, a robot was announced that it can cook 360 custom hamburgers in an hour. Walmart 
Well, Foxconn, the largest producer of computers in the world, in China, employs 1.2 million Chinese people. Their goal in the next three years is to have one million robots replace those people. Walmart spends $12 million a minute on labor for checkout. Guess what they're looking to automate? We already see it in supermarkets, so you're automating things. When did you go to a bank last? I mean, ATMs took out all that. How about a service? I remember when people used to put it in and pump your gas. Doesn't happen. Google's robotic car has now been licensed in California and Nevada for testing. What are the implications of a robotic driver to the trucking industry, to the taxi industry? We have got things coming at us that are going to so dramatically change our economy. Is that's where higher education has got to be picking up the speed because these changes are coming and it, this is the only place places like this where there's the collection of knowledge that can give us some answers as to what's next now, um, did that sort of hit us? I'd like to take a, a swing at that one too if you don't mind because I as the author of a, an article called Mook Donald's our, <laughs> our most fast food I think I, I, I've been thinking about that. And I really like the metaphor of the food industry and education. But I don't see it as all negative. In, in other words, I think what happens in the food industry now is what's going to happen in education in that, okay, I don't get all my food at a f fancy restaurant. I do from time to time. It's harder now that I'm a vegan. But I do you know, go to a <laughs> fast food restaurant from time to time. And I go to some <clears throat> mid-level chains. And some of the times I go to a, a mom and pop and sometimes... <clears throat> but what I do is I, and sometimes I go to a grocery store and cook for myself and my wife. So you have all these options in terms of how you get your nutrition. But in education, we go and turn ourselves over to one institution for a multi-year period to buy one product that they defined without a lot of input from me and without a lot of input from the people who would potentially hire me and without a lot of input from people like you who care about, like those of you who have spoken, who care about you know, the soft skills and whether people are critical thinkers and whether they're compassionate and whether they're kind and whether they're all these other things. So what I see happening is people will put together their educational diet the same way and we'll be assembling a lot of smaller credentials, some of which we'll get. Like Bill said, if I see an ad for a job and I've got everything but this and the job, I have to turn in my papers in a, in a month, I'm going to want to go to a relatively fast place to get this last, you know, an endorsement in teamwork or something. And again, it's not going to look as good as somebody who went and did a six-month program, you know, at, at, in Penn State's business school and did, got a leadership credential that way. But I think people are going to end up assembling academic credentials the same way. And I think that I didn't hear Bill say, it's interesting how we all, we all know that, you know, we come with our own background and we do different things with the same information. So I didn't hear be more like a corporation. I heard be less like a university less like some a big organization with a, a monopoly that doesn't really have to respond, that can do things slowly. So, uh, you know, and there's a difference, and I, I you know, we, I think we all agree that we don't want to just jump to the complete other extreme of, a, of a, some sort of a spectrum. But I do think that there's a real opportunity for us to create something different and to ask. So the word customer yesterday uh, <laughs> ruffled a few feathers. But so we don't have to think of students as customers, but we probably do have to say, what is it they're going to want from us, from an organization like this? They're probably going to want those high-level credentials, and it's probably going to be about, you know, not replacing teachers, but replacing teachers, moving teachers to a new place, rehyphen place, where what they're about is the higher-order things that, that people were looking for here. So, and I think it's a really exciting time where we have the opportunity to build that and decide what, what is it that we want to offer along this spectrum of opportunity? Should we be offering MOOCs or should we just let them get MOOCs from somewhere else? You know, should we accept credits, prior learning assessments, credits for things people learn from any source? Probably so. So we're probably going to end up doing shorter things for more people 
Uh, and people are probably going to end up paying for what we do for them, not, you know, redundant things that we ask them to do. Other questions, thoughts, comments? Matt, did I, I saw you shifting in your seat over there. Did you, did you have something you wanted to? No, we kind of covered it. Okay, all right. Other thoughts, comments? Okay. Well, if not, we, uh, we have uh, spent our hour together. Um, thank you for coming. We uh, will, you can continue this. There are lots of Yammer groups, and if you're interested in this sort of thing, maybe we should put together a group really on sort of redesigning higher education. I think, in fact, I'll, I'll do that. I'll create a Yammer group on redesigning higher education where you can have this conversation extended a little further and uh, think about what it is higher education might become. Greg, do you have any comments? No? Questions? Comments? I'll bring you the mic. Oh, and there's another one, too. Okay, great. Let's see if that one's on. Well, I appreciate your comments, and I listen to speakers like you and read this all the time, and don't sleep at night because of the worry about the impact on the university. And we're seeing at the edges a lot of what you're talking about. But I also can tell you today, right now, we're on our goal for a $2 billion campaign. Applications are in pretty good shape. You know, and, and I'm also been on the faculty senate for 10 years, and conversations like this are not occurring. The point is that things are moving along as they have forever. Yep. Yet all these other things you point out are also happening. Right. When are we at the tipping point where if we don't begin to change, it's going to be too late? I mean, because like, you, you're talking, in some cases, you're, you're trying to be provocative. Right, right. And some of it is happening already. Right. Yet we see a blockbuster store which now sends, sells Halloween costumes instead of being a blockbuster store. Right, right. And people wanted people to come to blockbuster. Right. Right. You know, when is this going to happen? Because how hard do we push and how hard do we try to get attention of the, uh, the university around this? On, on my website, Epic 2020, right under Epic 2020, there's another 10-minute video that I did before uh, a group of about 100 angel investors up in Columbus uh, a few months ago. It's titled, 2012, The Tipping Point. You've passed it. So it's, if that isn't a sense of urgency, I don't know what it is. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the things in my Air Force days um, that it always amazed me was one of the hardest things to do to train a fighter pilot to do is to pull those ejection handles. Now his plane, the engine may quit, and all the gauges, and, and your gauges haven't started to change yet, which that's, that's a different story. But the gauges are going, he sees the ground coming up, but where he's sitting is still safe. And as soon as he pulls those handles, all hell's going to break loose. And they go right into the ground. And, but again, I, I, I'd say look at the integrated steel industries in the 1950s. And, you know, all their data said, and they were fine, and they were going the same paradigm. And it made perfect rational sense. And, and Christensen shows you industry after industry after industry where that happens. The, the conventional wisdom makes sense, but has the world changed? And those are two independent questions that need to be asked. Because when it happens, it's going to happen very quickly. In, in California, that legislation that's going through, where you're going to be required to give a transferable credit for a proctored exam, Harrisburg, is where the change is going to go. It's not going to be here. It's going to be a two dozen people sitting on education committees that are responding to parents who are going nuts because the tuition's going up. Courses are not available for graduation. How many students will not graduate this year from Penn State because there are not enough courses to take? Those are the kind of problems that are common coming at you from a whole different direction. We have this is silly, but I can't resist. Um, you mentioned the Gardner reports, the, um, the 
illustration you had for the hype mm -hmm. cycle. Mm -hmm. I want, I'm going to do a plug for the library. The Gartner reports are on the library's homepage under the list of databases under G. Look for the Gartner reports. And I, I want to, uh, libraries have been leading the charge on this whole thing for the last decade. If there's one group in education that I say consistently gets it, it's the libraries. Your knowledge commons and all those kinds of things, you guys are on the cutting edge of doing all of that. And so, good for you. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for coming. And thank those of you who are out on the media site. Thank you for participating remotely. And again, look for, I'll, I'll create a uh, Penn State Network Yammer group. That's something like the uh, future of higher education, something like that. Hope to see you there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. Thank